that permission i think you have that a second and uh, yeah yeah okay can you share my see my screen now yes yes sir yeah okay <clears throat> Okay, I think we're all set, so you can. Yeah, so just if you could transition the slides and in case just to check once before we get started, I hope it will reflect here. It's transitioning? Just, um, yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so I'll just uh, take a quick minute to introduce Dr. Bose and then I think it will be all yours, sir. Uh, so uh, it's it's a uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have you, sir, in this uh, forum. Uh, this is a platform which is uh, Bangalore CS chapter, and we uh, host uh, webinars over every month on on circuits and systems. And uh, today we have uh, Dr. Pradeep Bose from uh, uh, IBM TJ Watson Research. Uh, he would be uh, giving us a talk on secure and resilient autonomy in AI centric system. So it's my uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Bose. Uh, Dr. Pradeep Bose is a distinguished research staff member and a manager of the efficient and resilient systems department at IBM TJ Watson Research Center at USA. He holds a BTEC degree from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and later he has an MS and PhD from University of Illinois. His current research interests are in the areas of energy efficiency and resilience of AI centric systems. He's a member of IBM Academy of Technology, and he holds uh, the title of IBM Master Inventor. He is the fellow of IEEE as well. Uh, so uh, with, with that, sir, I would like to, uh, I, I mean, I would like you to start the talk. And before that, I just wanted to add to all the members that uh, we would be uh, keeping the, uh, all of you will be muted. In case you have questions, you can put it in the Q&A panel and uh, the, I will read it out for uh, Dr. Bose. So, uh, sir, if you can take a pause in the, uh, in the right, point of your presentation so that we can take a few questions and definitely we will have a few questions at the end to uh, address as well. Thank you, sir, again for accepting okay. the invitation and giving this talk uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ayan, for um, inviting me to give this seminar. It's my pleasure and my privilege to speak to such a educated and enlightened audience. So the title of my talk is uh, uh, Secure and Resilient Autonomy in AI-Centric Systems. And this research in part was sponsored by DARPA, by a program at DARPA. Uh, I will refer to that occasionally in the program, in the, uh, in the presentation. And some aspects of this research are also part of a formal study, a research initiative sponsored by IBM Academy of Technology. Now, can you all hear me fine? I just wanted to make a, a quick check. Uh, yes, sir, we can uh, we can hear you. Okay. okay. And sir, as discussed with you, can we start the recording for this session if you're okay? I'm okay with that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, Dr. Devish, could you please start the recording? Thank you. Okay. Sure. So again, uh, yeah, this is uh, the secure and resilient autonomy in AI centric systems. And, you know, the project is partially sponsored by DARPA, as indicated here, and also some aspects of this research are sponsored by the IBM Academy of Technology. So, again, I, as instructed by the moderator, uh, Dr. Ayan Datta, um, uh, I will be pausing at certain points for QA. And I'll try my best to finish on time. <laughs> so the talk outline is uh, motivational. Initially, I'll be talking about motivational background, what's new, why now. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, you know, why we're doing, why we're interested in this particular topic area. And then I'll go into uh, elements of secure and resilient autonomy and then future directions. So why now? Um, is basically, you know, many of you have seen in this Turing lecture, a new golden age for computer architecture by David Patterson and John Hennessy. 
And um, he, he will, that was in 2018, I believe. And you can see from the graphic on, on the right here that the whole trend of performance is kind of on the on, on a saturating kind of trend where uh, you know the, you can see that the CISC revolution was doing 2x every 3.5 years and then the risk came in and eventually an end of ten art scaling as we know it caused uh, which caused the emergence of the multi-core era uh, where we had this thing 2x every 3.5 years and now it's more like 2.2x every six years with Amdahl's law kicking in. And the end of line, that's a question mark, uh, that, uh, that, that gap is now increasing like 20 years or something, it could be. So the point is, what do we do with this trend uh, the whole IT industry is based on uh, the uh, sort of Morse law. Uh, when I translate it to performance, it's like it's approximately 2x every uh, two years or every 18 months, in fact, was the original, right? So slowing of Morse law, no more Denard scaling, microarchitecture techniques such as instruction level parallelism, uh, multi-core, et cetera, are inefficient and hence burn energy. Uh, state of computer security is embarrassing for all of us in the computing field. It seems, um, you know, there's a story every uh, week or every day almost these days in the newspapers about some breach happening. So it seems unlikely the systems will ever uh, become secure using software-only solutions. So, uh, you know, how can we build more trustworthy, uh, dependable hardware software systems is not just the software, software, hardware subsystems. Um, so all of these issues were discussed in this during award lecture. And more specifically, you know, so, so, so the, this, this issue was discussed, this was the title of the Turing talk. But as, as you can see, uh, the domain specific hardware software co-design was a big piece of it. And of course, as I was mentioning, enhanced security and open instruction sets and agile chip development were stressed. So domain specific hardware software co-design uh, is a one of the driving uh, trends in a, one of the trends uh, which is driving computer system design arguably in the near future uh, because of the underlying technology. Uh, trend of slowing down the post and that's basically a direct consequence of that at the same time uh, you know we can see on this uh, new slide slide number five a new era of computing where ai systems you know there's been a huge trend as you all know um, in, in terms of uh, how things are evolving very rapidly over time artificial intelligence is here and is here to stay. Um, these cognitive or AI systems learn and interact naturally with people who amplify what either humans or machines could do on their own. So it's most more like an aid, right? As, as you can see, this started with you know tabulating systems era uh, that IBM uh, started like that uh, in international business machines was tabulating machines initially, tab, uh, tabulating systems. And then you had this programmable systems era uh, where progressively a lot of things happen. The chess machines, automatic uh, ch chess, Deep Blue, you might have heard of Deep Blue, where uh, you know, the Gary Kasparov, the reigning champion, was beaten by, a, by, by an IBM a Deep Blue machine. And then more recently, some of you may have heard about uh, the Watson Jeopardy. So this is almost the start of the modern uh, AI era for us. Uh, because the IBM Watson uh, Jeopardy system beat the human champion. This is a very complicated game. And uh, even there, just to understand the questions in this game, for those of you who, who watched Jeopardy, is, is difficult uh, for a human being even to answer, uh, to sort of adequately uh, understand the question that is posed and then uh, to, to, to provide the answer. So that was a major breakthrough. And in between, before in the 1980s, 
1990s, you, you, we had uh, this intermediate system called expert systems, rules-based expert systems, which seem pretty old now, but there was also uh, an initial uh, emergence of artificial intelligence systems, some of you will recall. All of this, why is this happening now? Is because of big data, this is indicated here, and the progress of processor technology, right? Thanks to uh, processor architecture, design, and the underlying CMOS technology. All of this have come together in a big way to cause this revolution. So we understand that. But the new thoughts are in this area, what is resilient AI? Because now that AI is pervasive in our society, um, um, we have to make sure that it is resilient, just like we have worried about computer reliability in the normal classical sense, like mainframes. They're extremely reliable, they don't go down, right? Uh, but AI systems, now that they're part of us, part of our society, we have to think about resilient AI, secure AI, ethical AI maybe, and even compassionate AI. So these are some of the uh, visionary kind of issues, questions that are haunting us. So in the next slide, I mean, I mentioned here uh, that that was just the int out, uh, motivational outline, but we are going to get into elements of secure and resilient autonomy, as I mentioned, and we are going to focus on the particular application domain of self-driving cars or autonomous vehicles. Uh, they could be cars, they could be ships, they could be drones, uh, but doesn't matter. Self, uh, you know, driving or autonomous vehicles, because that's a nice AI application end to end. And clearly the issues of resilience and security are very, very important in these kinds of application domains. So let's get on with that. So one of the things that, which is unique in the project that we are pursuing is this whole concept of adaptive swarm intelligence. So uh, this slide says from swarm intelligence to adaptive swarm intelligence. Many of you may have heard of swarm intelligence, which is a bio-inspired AI technique and more like a, a optimization technique now. You, many of you may have heard about swarm um, intelligence in the context of ant colony optimization or ACO or particle swarm optimization PSO. So it's, it's like in a swarm of bees or a swarm of ants or a flock of birds. These are natural uh, phenomena in from our natural world. Uh, uh, these, these species in the natural habitat, they know how to swarm together and do cooperative computation, uh, which is, seems to be extremely efficient, right? So uh, um, the question is, what can we do with that paradigm? And the, and the thing that I was trying to say here is adaptive swarm intelligence, which is the future, which is something that we are working on. Uh, it's a natural fit for the IoT, where large number of devices agents interact in an ad hoc manner. So this is bio-inspired, obviously, but can we apply it in a very practical setting for collaborative comp computation and inference, AI inference. Uh, one of the issues that uh, that is uh, prevalent in today's AI systems and getting to the dependability or resilience aspects right away is that they are fragile. Let's face it, they're fragile because they break in the field. They can break in the field because of this uh, 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 thing which is illustrated here on the bottom right uh, normally, this factory trained device, trained with lots and lots of data, when it is deployed in the field, it's working fine. But then when a, a surprise element happens, when a change in the data pattern happens, uh, the accuracy can plummet sharply and uh, uh, basically breaks the device. So one of the um, uh, challenges, ongoing challenges in this world of AI, uh, current machine learning systems is how to obviate this brittleness, this brittleness in, uh, from the point of view of accuracy loss when the infield data suddenly deviates from 
what it was trained with in the factory. So there's a project uh, program called uh, Lifelong Learning or L2M um, in, uh, sponsored by DARPA. We are not part of that program, but I'm just making you aware. You can Google, Google uh, for it and, and find, find uh, more about this program, which is trying to attack this precise problem. So this is part of the AI resilience problem that we will be looking at. Uh, now, this adaptive swarm intelligence is not just about autonomous cars, although that is our driving application in this project. Uh, it can be applied to other fields easily, as you can guess, for network cybersecurity, um, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, uh, even distributed power management in, on a chip or in a, in a data, at the data center level because with large number of computational cores or servers in a data center, it is very difficult to have a centralized power manager or resource manager, resource manager which scales. So there's a scalability problem. So distributed power management, resource management is a, 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 a challenging uh, problem. And here is where, again, if you treat each of these servers or cores on a chip as intelligent agents trying to uh, self-manage uh, this problem of power allocation and redistribution as the workload changes, then the same adaptive swarm intelligence can be applied. Um, now, uh, and also to network cybersecurity and applications of that sort. Uh, now, this technology is not so exotic, this uh, connected cars anymore. Since we started, uh, this has already become uh, product productized. Uh, you can look up this website, uh, Too Simple is the name of the company, which is pursuing you know, automated uh, uh, truck navigation. It's already here, uh, where these trucks communicate wirelessly with each other. Uh, to sort of uh, have a convoy of cars or trucks uh, move to deliver products. So, th and this is actually uh, deployed already. So uh, slowly but surely, companies like Uber and others are deploying automated cars or self-autonomous cars in their commercial sector in certain cities in the US. Another interesting trend uh, is uh, this wireless power transmission. And, in, and this can be of particular relevance in vehicular swarms. And uh, you know, I'm pointing you to this uh, very interesting um, TEDx talk, uh, which is indicated on the bottom left here, swarm intelligence from bees feeding bees to cars charging cars. So um, uh, Tim Landgraf in this, uh, YouTube video uh, sort of argues about the future uh, where uh, these swarm of cars uh, can be wirelessly helping each other in even in elect electric cars, uh, which, which are so currently uh, the problem uh, of electric cars is that uh, they need to be charged okay, quite often and for long periods of time. A way out, he's pointing out, in this very interesting visionary talk is that uh, this swarm of cars it could be exchanging uh, power with each other to help each other out in, 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 in cases where certain cars lose uh, are short of battery power. Um, uh, so wireless power transmission is becoming very real. Uh, very recently in early in August of this year, New Zealand, a company in New, Ze New Zealand um, launched the first uh, long range wireless power transmission. So uh, this is becoming very real um, and many of you uh, may have seen these uh, news articles. Of course, in small scale, this wireless uh, charging is already here like cell phone charging and so forth. You all know that, uh, but this is something to keep in mind. Now, switching gears a little bit, saying how do we build the system on chip? Because we are a set of engineers uh, 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 in, in, you know, computer, computer uh, engineers and scientists, we are interested in finding an end-to-end -end solution for this, uh, maybe a cloud-to-edge complete solution for this. So at the edge, you need a processor or a system on a chip 
which will be sitting inside your future car uh, to power all of this uh, you know, interesting uh, functions. So with that in mind, you know, let's get into that problem a little bit, saying the if you look at today's systems on a chip, the trend is to integrate more capabilities into uh, these intelligent uh, system on chip uh, edge devices, more cramming more and more accelerators. Somebody coined the term C of accelerators. So uh, you have a, a few general purpose processors, but surrounding it, there are a host of different accelerators and even FPGAs and what have you, right? Uh, so the question, and this this makes it very very hard to program, arguably. So with that in mind, I mean uh, the, the 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 DARPA started this uh, program called Domain Specific System on Chip program, which was started a couple of years ago. We are midway through it. This is a four year program, um, and the whole point here is okay. Today we cannot fully utilize our current multiprocessor systems on the left of this chart, but what we want, this is the future, we want to manage an increase of capabilities with integrated specialized accelerators. We want uh, simultaneously, with, want, the, want, want, the pro, want the device, this SOC, to run multiple applications simultaneously. We want intelligent tools to aid the programmers so that programming these beasts is, is not so troublesome. And we want domain specific selection and layout. We want a systematic way of deciding what are the right accelerators to support this particular application domain. In our case, let us say the connected vehicles, the swarm of vehicles and that particular application. But in, for any application, this is a generic problem. You identify an application, and uh, as I was saying at the beginning of this talk, this seems to be the future hope of keeping the IT industry alive because the main server um, cannot be refreshed as before in every two of, or three years. It might take six years, eight years, 12 years, right? Before we are able to ship new servers because of the way technology has, uh, has, uh, has, has treated us lately. So uh, the hope is to identify domain specific accelerators which plug in to the main server, uh, maybe through a PCI attached you know, mechanism, these SOCs, so that you, know, you continue to get speed up. And these accelerators, these SOCs should be reasonably easy. And so that's where the agile development comes, comes into play. It should be easy to put together. So with that, uh, and easy to program. So with that in mind, let's get into our the IBM-led EPOX project, which is uh, in a uh, the stands for efficient programmability of cognitive heterogeneous systems. As we saw, these systems are heterogeneous, highly heterogeneous, with many different types of accelerators populating the chip. So with that in mind, we started this uh, this project. And we start with this EPOX reference application, which is about this connected car, connected autonomous vehicles application. Uh, we developed this application ourselves. I'll talk about it. Then there's a compiler and scheduler and this ontology and design space exploration as a software module. Also working in collaboration with the compiler during the design phase of this SOC and the whole point, as I said before, is to discover the right accelerators automatically from uh, the from the source code of the applications. And then once uh, that's the, the design phase is over, over, you know what accelerators to use, you know your network on chip uh, interconnect that you have chosen, and you've also homed in on a memory architecture for programmable deep purposes. Uh, you want the programming to be easy. So there is a certain memory architecture which comes with uh, chips so that uh, the coherence issues, the memory coherence issues are not uh, something that the programmer has to deal with. It's dealt with by hardware, in hardware. Then you implement 
you, know, you, can, you initially get an FPGA prototype, you do some more experiments, the compiler generates code, of course, and you do some experiments. This is the agile flow. You can iterate, that's the whole point. And then eventually when you're happy, you do your domain specific actual ASIC synthesis, and then you're done. The whole point uh, is uh, the goal of the, such an agile development uh, process is to get significant increase uh, in uh, productivity. So 10x to 100x reduction in per person years uh, in order to get to that FPGA at least. And the backend ASIC process is, uh, is not something that we are uh, fixing. Uh, that there are separate DARPA programs which deal with uh, such as the POSH program, P-O-S-H. Uh, you can Google and find out that deals with silicon compilation. So go get from uh, this early stage RTL uh, to the chip in one and a push button sense. But that's, that's very interesting too. But we are dealing with this front end. How do I, uh, in an agile fashion, quickly uh, get some FPGA hardware uh, especially, and then uh, do a compiler um, a port and a software uh, systems uh, port. There's also a scheduler, a smart intelligence scheduler. I won't have time to talk about all aspects of this. I'll just give you snippets of some of this, and especially with respect to uh, the recent uh, forking off to this resilience and security issue. Those aspects I will try to cover. So. Are there any uh, questions at this point, up to this point? Maybe I can pause a little bit to see whether somebody has a question, quick question. Yeah, uh, as of now, sir, I don't see uh, okay. anything on the chat box. So if I, so if there is anything, maybe in the next section, I'll take it. Okay. Please, please, so let, let, sh let's, let's proceed forward. So behind all of this, I want to paint for you the system architectural vision for the cognitive era, for the AI era, intelligent. And this is uh, like the new uh, kind of era that we are in already. And this vision says the future is about a bunch of different uh, devices, IoT devices, if you will, wirelessly interconnected um, and all backed by this uh, cloud, ubiquitous cloud which is supporting all of our devices. Uh, we already are gotten very used to that, right? Our cell phones, for example. But it's more just more than just cell phones in the future. It's more than uh, the, the Apple iWatch or uh, the, you know, the, the smart glasses. It's, it's about drones, it's about autonomous cars, it's about um, uh, industrial robots. And many of these will be swarming with each other and uh, in a wirelessly, and that's what we call swarm AI. Uh, so, uh, or you can call it collaborative computation or collaborative inference or collaborative perception when it comes to autonomous vehicles, uh, we call it collaborative perception so that you can understand what you're seeing collaboratively, increase your accuracy of what you're seeing so that you can have a safe and accident-free experience, right? So what are the uh, uh, implications of this system architecture? Uh, we have to deal with unstable wireless bandwidth. So there's unreliability everywhere here. So therefore resilience comes in, resilient system reconfiguration. If one node fails, uh, how can um, other nodes help? Uh, there are elements of this, by the way, interestingly, we already know how to do some of this in a mainframe setting. When one processor core dies in a huge mainframe, uh, the user does not even know, but we have software which uh, sort of brain transplants the state of the core into an idle core and the computation goes on. So the user is not even aware. This technology has existed for, for decades uh, within IBM. So elements of that can now be abstracted upwards to this new world where this is a fault tolerant kind of uh, environment where these cooperating devices can work together for doing problem solving. And uh, when failures happen, 
or even security wise when attacks happen there should be ways to reconfigure and move forward uh, the actual needs at the edge uh, near needs near the edge uh, are like on device inference on device training low power extremely low power um, and on low voltage possibly harvested living on harvested energy dealing with harsh environment resilience security against attacks these are some of the features that must power some of these devices of the future at the edge although the resilient cloud is there at the, at the, in, in, in the, at the, at the back end to support all of this no doubt but still uh, you, you need so the cloud is definitely a big part of providing the resilient cover so to speak so this is uh, a, a slightly bigger picture from uh, AI in highly interconnected scenarios, such as for connected cars. So here you see even more advent adventures vision where these cars are swarming, uh, wirelessly interacting, but there are also uh, sort of e UAV or drone servers, if you will, uh, to support this. There are, um, you know, obviously, uh, you have smart devices sitting in buildings to help. All of this, there are the cell phone towers, uh, which help in all of this. So, uh, and there are edge servers that are indicated here. Uh, these can also be part of this of the big solution. All right. So this is what we and we are envisioning. Now, going back to this epochs reference application that we ourselves constructed, uh, it's an open source thing. You can look at it, download it, and contribute to it. Uh, we would like it very much. So over the last couple of years, we have been working and developing this representative um, autonomous vehicle application, of course, with an emphasis on swarming. That is, uh, that is the distinguishing feature, how these things communicate with each other. So for example, uh, this small diagram here shows this figure uh, that you have this sensing fabric, which in the R cases a combination of computer vision and radar or lidar imaging so you have cameras detecting objects and classifying them using computer vision techniques uh, uh, you have radar lidar kind of sensors to detect objects and 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 compute the distance they are very good at that combining the two together you can create uh, a map uh, which has both information of what am I seeing and how far is it. So that kind of a map is created locally within each car. And then from other cars, you can have other information, similar information coming in uh, to help navigate. And so then one big job is how do I in real time create a fused map to uh, help in the navigation of this car uh, to make it a smarter car, uh, gaining in knowledge from the perception that is received uh, from uh, uh, the vision, the perspective that is received from other neighboring cars. So that's what we are, this is called cooperative perception or collaborative perception for connected autonomous vehicles. And this is the application. So uh, that's perhaps uh, the easiest way to motivate is to show a demo that we have created uh this is a software demo but parts of this are are, are are also offloadable to the fpga that we have constructed to support this uh but let let let's go through this um i i don't know can can you actually uh, see this thing move moving i hope you can uh, see some yes sir. okay good so i'll just narrate this you can see in this scenario uh, that there are two cars, uh, there, there's this pedestrian here, uh, and there's a stationary truck, and there is a, another car on the back end there, which will try to move. And, and this, this stationary truck is kind of obstructing vision. So uh, there is this, uh, you know, light, uh, this maps being created locally. And, uh, you know, you'll, we'll see a scenario where uh, there is no swarming, so there, you know, the, without collaborative perception, what happens? Why it is hazardous? Because this car will start moving on the back end and the pedestrian will start crossing. But because of the obstruction created by this big 
big truck here, this, uh, which is standing at the intersection, which is not moving. Uh, it's creating, obstructing the view of this other car. So when the pedestrian starts moving, the autonomous car will be blindsided and hit the pedestrian. Not a good thing at all. <laughs> so onboard sensors are not able to detect. But with collaborative perception, what happens is, uh, okay, because of the, the, these maps being shared, uh, the, the, this, the combined map um, uh, that you see cr being created on the left is able to help the car uh, to sense that there is a pedestrian coming and therefore it will stop in time and the pedestrian will be saved. So you can see again the pedestrian moving and the car stops and the pedestrian safely crosses. So uh, this at intersections, this kind of thing is the first obvious thing to, to help because um, in a, um, the, 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 you can't see everything. Sorry, uh, let me get back to. And so at intersections, this, this technology is very helpful because um, you cannot uh, see necessary everything, this autonomous car, but another car can help you um, uh, with, with, with sending a map that they're seeing, the, the visual map that they're seeing, and if you combine them, if you fuse them in real time, your intelligence effectively increases. This is uh, sort of what I was indicating before. So uh, if you don't have the information, uh, the, uh, there could be brittleness in your AI in the field because uh, you, you don't you know you don't have the full information and therefore it might break in the field even though you're a very sophisticated engine trained in the factory with lots and lots of data you fail in the field right uh, now for our project uh, so i was indicating how we did that uh, we already crafted an soc a system on a chip um, uh, at least in FPGA form, and now the actual chip tape out uh, for that is happening in mid October. Uh, again, sponsored by DARPA. So we are very, very working actually very hard right now to, to make that tape, chip tape out possible. But the, with the running FPGA itself, we can create very nice demos. So uh, the first step was to create a, 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 a very small kind of mini ERA. Uh, so that we, we know what we are doing. And so this is that mini ERA, a single car with two sensors only. One is the camera input to sense the image, saying what am I seeing, car or pedestrian, et cetera, bike. And the other is an FMCW uh, radar input, which is the main function is to detect the object and to, and to calculate the distance. Distance is important. So these two sensors then go to the decision analytics and this Viterbi sensor, or this Viterbi sensor, um, uh, is is the is the analog of is the, is is what we use for swarming. Basically, other uh, cars are sending information, uh, and the Viterbi decoder is decoding that and sending that to the decision analytics. Very very simple um, state automaton here for this engine based on these three streaming inputs, I have to decide at every epoch. Uh, so it is done on an epoch by epoch basis. Uh, and then um, it sends vehicular control actuations. And uh, this is the kind of the SOC which, uh, which pops out of this. And uh, we have made demonstration of this along with how, um, uh, you know, we have actually demonstrated the agile IP integration stats and one of the key features. Um, oh, and before I, I should have also mentioned um, uh, this before is that the there's a compiler and the smart scheduler and all of that also with this to make all of this happen in real time. Now, this automated discovery of accelerators from application source code is something I wanted to highlight to this particular audience because you will relate to it. It's an important function a part of the automated design saying, given a workload suite and application domain, how do I automatically uh, find out the parts which I need to accelerate? And some of them may be completely unconventional accelerators, something which I didn't think about. 
And that's uh, the beauty of automation. It's not like, you know, I know that this module uh, is exercised, uh, this fu particular function, uh, say a bitter bee, is very often used, therefore I will build an accelerator. Sometimes very strange new accelerators can pop out, which a human being wouldn't be able to infer necessarily. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll, I'll pause right after this, so you can start as, uh, framing your questions. This is another place I will stop. But uh, to summarize what we have done so far, uh, not that I'll have time to go into every detail, is that the super agile kind of FPGA level IP integration and bring up, we have shown that depending on the particular application workload, you can get 10x to 100x reduction in person years. Uh, there is this uh, open source um, uh, um, link here, uh, this ESP, Embedded Systems Platform. Some of you may have read about it from Columbia University, uh, who are our partners. So we are, we are subcontracting this piece to Columbia University. Professor Luca Carloni and team have developed this. This is open source. Uh, the smart scheduler we at IBM have done. Uh, and uh, you know, again, again, this is also open source. Uh, and the application itself is open source, both ERA and mini ERA are open source. So, uh, and you can see the kind of speed up numbers, et cetera, that we have uh, demonstrated through. And there are many, many uh, papers and publications uh, which I can later share with you if there is interest. Uh, so, uh, so let me stop here because we are now going into uh, the next, uh, the last piece, essentially, the advers adversarial robustness and resilience and security issues. So let me pause here for some questions, if any. Yeah, so, sir, I have a question. Maybe I can start with that. Sure. Uh, this is uh, so uh, one of the things which I wanted to understand uh, here is, is it more of uh, that every uh, swarm will be uh, sourcing their maps to a centralized server which will be communicating to all the swarms or is it like uh, the maps will be shared across each of the elements of the swarms uh, the reason i'm no asking question. this is again is this again because of the response time because if it is a centralized then the response time will be higher exactly you have a very good question i mean that's the whole point uh, in, uh, in reducing the latency you want this uh, the edge to be intelligent on its own right there is a cloud there to back you up if all else fails but when you are doing autonomous vehicles you have to respond quickly and uh, so there, therefore the need for uh, the edge devices to help each other um, so the classic example is for example uh, the, the cloud may know about a particular in intersection uh, fine in that it knows uh, everything about a neighborhood, but something strange happens, a tree falls. And it is no, no time for uh, the cloud to help. So it's the local intelligence, uh, the collaborative perception across cars, which will help in that case, right? Or a uh, or traffic light is broken and you have to rely on hand gestures of a police, uh, a police, uh, poli policeman so, or a policewoman. So that those, those cases you have to quickly, in the cloud does not have the information. Something um, has happened right there and then. So you want the edge itself to collaboratively do the perception uh, as the first try. If things fail, uh, then you have to rely on the cloud, which arguably has the latest information uh, or uh, can pull a lot of agents, uh, all, a lot of cars, and they all upload their information to cloud and so, yes, the cloud is the centralized repository with a lot of global information, but we want it to be the last resort in this wired, wireless world. Uh, today, by the way, we do not have swarming, so it is the cloud which is the, the only backup point for such help. But this is the big difference we are trying to create through the swarm technology. Good question. Any other? uh no sir i think we can proceed. okay we can proceed uh so the next thing I'll, I'll try to speed up and finish quickly but security and resilience issues in ai ml systems uh obviously this is extremely important and many of you have seen you know are exposed to this 
uh, phrase of adversarial robustness theory and practice. There's an excellent tutorial here, which I'm pointing to. And, you know, if it's taken from that tutorial, uh, this ex classic example saying, you know, in, the, in, in today's machine learning systems are fantastic. As you know, uh, the automated machine learning systems, uh, CNNs, have been able to do much better than human beings in terms of recognizing object. Yes, uh, yet they are very fragile because in this example, if you're seeing a, a picture of a pig and you add uh, a very, very small amount of noise, of course, it has to be suitably crafted, it's not random noise, then you can uh, fee, uh, uh, fool the, the device into thinking that it's an airliner. It will see the same picture, see the effect of this small amount of noise to a human being doesn't change the picture but to a machine learning system which was trained with 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 data with 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 images like this big uh it gets fooled uh to thinking it's an airliner so there are many many other examples uh, of fragility uh, so there is the, the 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 classic example of stop signs uh which can be with a small amount of disfigurement you can fool the automated system. Small tamperings can cause uh, you know, these signs to be confused. Whereas for a human being, no problem. We filter, we managed to filter small corruptions out. Machines today are not so good at it. So obviously these, these are important problems to, 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 to worry about. And in general, uh, for our particular application, you know, this resilience uh, and, and energy efficiency, they sort of uh, at the edge uh, have to go hand in hand with each other. Uh, I've talked about in other talks, this, this vicious circle between the power wall and the reliability wall, because in order to save energy or make it more power efficient, there's a tendency to go to very low voltages and, you know, skimp corners basically cut corners, right? And, 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 and that leads to uh, res reliability issues, which you try to then augment using, uh, you know, redundancy and latch hardening, parity, ECC and so forth. But then that defeats the purpose because your power goes right back up. And so this is the special vicious circle, how to have a cross layer optimization procedure and as, uh, hardware and software to try to circumvent this problem where you can have very low power efficient computing, but also resilient is one of the classic problems that uh, we and others have, have dealt with. So uh, one of the examples uh, is, uh, in it's, uh, people have worked on it, for example, Harvard's um, uh, David Group, Dave, Professor David Brooks and company, uh, they have worked on these chips called the Minerva, you can look it up. Uh, the Minerva DNN from Harvard. So this is a case of, again, uh, going lower power, but resilient, right? Um, very, very, very 9x reduction in power, but much, much more uh, you know, resilient. Uh, the resilience factor um, is, is very high, right? Similarly, in our case in IBM, we have for a while, we have been way back in IBM Power 7 product processor, we had this autonomous control loop, which is managing a performance and power autonomously, right? These are control loops, which are extremely important to, to sort of architect in a resilient fashion so that people cannot, cannot break in. Uh, we'll talk about those possibilities in a little bit later in this talk. But the point is in real systems today, there's a plenty, a huge amount of voltage card band uh, unnecessarily wasted power. And so can you operate dangerously by lowering the voltage knob for a given frequency of operation? Can you operate very, very dangerously and have uh, your safety net protect you? Say so when your sensor, in this case, this critical path monitor CPM sensor, sense, says that you're at the edge, then you can actuate your clock frequency, maybe put it lower, uh, drive it down lower so that it doesn't uh, crash the system so that you you know your frequency your frequency is commensurate with the low voltage that you're working with. So things of that sort have have we have, us and others we have published, and this brings into this question of optimal voltage point. What is the optimal voltage point? 
between performance, power, and reliability. So there has been some work that we have done using this Bravo mechanism. Uh, Kartik Swaminathan, my team, has driven this work. Uh, HPCA 2017 paper, you can look it up. So I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go through the, the, these slides. But basically, uh, the, the, you know, we are exploiting the fact that uh, when you operate low voltages, uh, some some of these SRAM bits will be unreliable. They can they can flip bits in it, and the question is, can you still operate with it? And and the answer is yes, uh, we can. And we have this Dante chip, which shows that you can drive down voltages really really small, and still be able to infer correctly, do inference uh, classification correctly. I think this was an older thing where we were do, dealing with things like you know, small, small uh, networks like uh, like MNIST and others, but nonetheless, the uh, the, the this this was um, you know we also did um, you know Alex Net and so forth also later, uh, and the whole point was to show that 30% energy savings compared to a dual supply configuration for a target accuracy within 2% of the maximum. So without compromising the accuracy, you can get a huge amount of energy savings. By operating in a you know with faults with you know you know these are and then another uh, thing then you can go further with this and show that you know can you actually uh, these are these are bit error kind of distributions that we got from our fabricated chip um, and to to get the distribution of how things uh, you know fail. And then using that, we can actually do robust models through error-aware training. So uh, this is an interesting concept, new concept, which says that, okay, assume that things are going to fail because they are you're operating at a really low voltage. So of course your SRAM, uh, which is holding all the weights of the CNN uh, or whatever neural network you have, um, in, 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 you have developed, uh, they're, they're going to be not so reliable. But if you know the the pattern, the distribution of how these failures happen. Can you not train the CNN in, in that faulty environment to begin with? So then, uh, since this is uh, machine learning uh, it's, uh, and these kinds of neural networks, they should be able to operate uh, uh, fine. And so these uh, results kind of show that here. And the, more, 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 the, the bottom line is the rob, a robust model generated for p equal one percent, which means probability of failure is one percent, which is pretty high, <laughs> at 0.83 volt uh, vmin, 0.83 of the vmin. So normal vmin at which the SRAM fails is a certain number, say 0.55 volts. You go even less than that, so 0.83 of that, and it still works uh, accurately. This inference machine, but 30 percent. Uh, um, uh, lower energy. So I would also like to point out some of these hazards that have been pointed out in the literature, the recent plunder vault security attack. Uh, you can look up these things. This is about uh, at attacking that control loop I was talking about, the voltage control loop, right? There have been actual um, bona fide as rec uh, attacks recognized by the security community and Fixes made uh, made by by the by the vendor in this case, which is a cell phone vendor. So the, this was the, you can look it up. So this this is uh, you know work done, um, you know, it, which is um, was presented at in, in, uh, these, these conferences, and then uh, you know, this uh, underlying academic work from Columbia University was done by Professor Simha Setu Madhavan which is the clock screw attack, which is a kind of related attack uh, that modern chips has. And you know, Sema and us, we work collaboratively. The, the idea was, sponsored, was originated by us, and he employed a very good student, Adrian Tang, to work on the problem. This is uh, now a bona fide attack, the clock screw attack, um, uh, attacking the power management system. Now, this energy attacks on server systems or large data centers has also been talked about previously. Uh, this particular uh, thing was talked about by uh, Zen Yu Wu 
and, uh, at uh, Usenix conference in back, way back in 2011. Uh, so it shows that energy attacks on server systems with a small number, number of malicious clients, you can bring down an entire data center. Uh, so, uh, you know, either uh, from a point of view of increased power consumption, or so the power consumption goes through the roof, uh, or uh, the response time increases uh, tremendously. So it's basically becomes a denial of service attack. So, uh, so that that has been recognized and this can be done, has been demonstrated. And so we ran a workshop at the host 2019 security uh, symposium last year. And uh, there is, uh, this, is a, this is one of the papers presented at that workshop uh, saying using power anomalies to, count, to counter evasive uh, microarchitectural attacks in embedded systems. Uh, and uh, basically you can also uh, look up this article. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that article uh, soon. But on our side, on the IBM side, we have proposed this guard mechanism or energy secure design. Uh, you can look up this HPC at 2017 paper on how to architect a, a guarded control system where you have an underlying uh, power control system, but there's a supervisor which is monitoring it and guarding against uh, those kind of attacks. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the about the host 2019 workshop that we did. Uh, we wrote an article, uh, myself and Shaibal Mukhopadhyay, and it's IEEE Micro 2019 article on Energy Square. And, on the system workshop. So there is a, a, a summary of all the work that was presented last year at that uh, workshop. So um, I know I have uh, at the end of my time, so I'll, I'll just philosophize at the end towards uh, some future work. And here I will talk about what is a self-aware system. So this is the, you know, the progression towards not just uh, not today's AI system, but in the future. Uh, more thinking or uh, uh, self-aware AI systems with consciousness. It's a it's a it's a bold challenge that uh, we are sort of barely dabbling with, but in particular, uh, you know, you could call it artificial consciousness, if you will, because you know, in the, today's AI systems are are obviously not conscious in the sense that they don't have a self of identity, uh, and, uh, as far as we know. Of course, this is philosophical stuff. As far as we know, the, these, these uh, self-driving cars, uh, when one pulls up, when a self-driving car pulls up next to you, uh, it might behave just like you, uh, but we don't think it's really aware of itself, right? Um, so how, in the question is, if you want to build ethical AI systems, thinking, truly thinking and caring uh, AI systems, uh, it, it, it's probably not possible to evade the issue of how are we conscious, like human beings or some others uh, in the animal kingdom. We think are, are self-aware in the sense that we have an I feeling, that I exist. And that also leads to the societal kind of feeling about others in my environment. Uh, true self-awareness uh, comes with this I consciousness, saying I exist, and there's uh, other uh, other objects and living beings and uh, around me. So that full uh, self-awareness and I consciousness is something that uh, we want to build towards. Uh, we want to do that because consciousness plus intelligence is awareness of others. Individual I becomes a collective societal I. And feeling preservation or survival becomes a societal or collective trait. Uh, feeling for others is related to ethics. And um, so from a heartless, cold, and fragile AI, we, we can just transform into resilient and ethical AI. It's is, is more philosophy than anything else right now, right? We know what uh, resilience is uh, from the dictionary. Uh, it, it, it basically means uh, the ability to sort of uh, bend back into the original shape. If you look at the uh, dictionary meaning from when you press it, when you bend it, the ability to bounce back. Uh, 
that is the definition of resilience. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we, we sort of have worried about this for a while. This is an edited book that we, we put together, Rugged Embedded Systems, Computing in Harsh Environments. So we have worried about this and now resilience is a key component of emotional intelligence, so it turns out. Uh, modern uh, psychologists and philosophers have recognized that for a while. Uh, and so that is a key part of emotional intelligence. And so this philosoph philosophical future research vision says, we already have this, uh, this thing which I showed before. Now, think a little bit more philosophically, shall we, where this pure cloud is kind of uh, the ubiquitous kind of all-knowing being, if you will, <laughs> under which all of these children, uh, intelligent agents are uh, working together in a collaborative fashion. And so with that, uh, you know, can, can, we, can, we, can we really do, uh, can, can computer scientists address and shed light on the so-called hard problem of consciousness? Uh, because there is sort of intelligence pervasive in this wireless connected world of, of today or, or the future, right? And uh, we are just in that sense, these intelligent agents are deriving knowledge from that wireless uh, knowledge universe, if you will, and operating uh, autonomously. And not so dissimilar according to ancient philosophy, even Indian philosophy, where there is consciousness is, is fundamental and we are operating by drawing upon that consciousness field uh, uh, as individual biological agents, nothing more than that. That is actually, if you look at uh, the Indian philosophy uh, of the of the Upanishads, uh, that you know of Advaita Vedanta, that's what they, what 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 they teach. So you can look up some. Some of you may already be plugged into this. This is from a spiritual point of view, from a philosophical point of view, but my curiosity is my uh, is how can we take advantage of that advanced thinking from many many years ago thousands of years ago which is becoming very a very important topic today in the field of artificial intelligence uh, you can look up uh, professor um, uh, daniel david chalmers work at nyu where he's talking about consciousness being fundamental uh, many people today are talking about that saying uh, uh, computer scientists cannot evade, evade this issue anymore. Consciousness is fundamental and um, not that it, consciousness emerges from material entities, it's the other way. Consciousness is fundamental and the material agents, including us, we are benefiting from that. So with that philosophical kind of uh, detour, let me end, <laughs> uh, pause here and uh, summarize here. I think I've covered all of this, but I'll keep it uh, open here, the summary chart, um, and uh, open up for questions. Uh, I know we have exceeded our time, but we started a little late also. Yeah, that, that's fine, sir. I think uh, it was a very nice talk, so thanks a lot. Um, I think you really uh, merged the, at the end the philosophy of Advaita Vedanta with uh, um, resilient system. It was uh, amazing to uh, see that, yeah. Uh, so before I get into uh, or collect all the questions from chat window, I would open up it for the panelist, uh, the other panelists, so that they can start the questions, and I'll I'll get back with the questions from the um, from the chat window. Yeah. Uh, so Devesh or any other panelist member, if you have any question, please go ahead. Okay, uh, so in interest of time, sir, I have one question here is uh, about the learning part of uh, the system which you mentioned. Uh, so is this the the question is specifically about the is the learning part only about ob uh, obstacle avoidance and detection or is it also from learning from the maps which are constructed uh, by sharing the knowledge? Right, I mean, it's, it's obviously um, um, much more than just obstacle avoidance. And it's, uh, common examples are of, uh, obstacle avoidance uh, or, or avoidance of uh, 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 hazards on the road, right? Tree, tree fallen 
or a tree obstructing a sign suddenly because of a storm or something or uh, potholes, you know, alerting some other car, avoid that. Or, you know, some of these features you will also already find in GPS, navig smart GPS navigational devices today, right? Uh, for those of you who, who have used this uh, facility called Waze, which is commonly used in, in North America, uh, there, of course, the collaboration happens through human beings, crowdsource. I mean, people actually help out, uh, other drivers help out. Uh, so, and that is uh, the Waze program knows about it and alerts you, saying, you know, this uh, avoid this this particular route because it's it's congested. It automatically reroutes you to to another route and so forth. Or there's an accident here, be careful. Or there's a you know somebody on the shoulder. Um, or even an animal is crossing, be aware. <laughs> so these things are, you know, I, I, I use Waze all the time. So the question what we are trying to do here is almost like that Waze application, except we want it completely automated, not to rely on uh, on, on, on human beings, which are often, often faulty. This, this information is sometimes faulty. So it can be much more than obstacle avoidance. It could be anything really, it could be, uh, could be could be uh, hazards that um, were unanticipated, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The next question which I have is, uh, how is this uh, error learning system different from error error correction which we were using till now? Okay, so error correction devices (ECC) uh, is a commonplace thing in all processors where uh, where a bit flip happens. You know, there is ability to self-correct that's actually a very very nice thing that we have in processors uh, detection and correction of errors but this is at a higher level right you, you make a, a wrong inference say in machine intelligence or in artificial intelligence with today's uh, data-driven uh, machine learning systems you as i was saying you train the device in factory with lots of data uh, but in the field, that data you may mislead you. Somebody has tampered with it, as I was showing through those, um, you know, tamperings. Or uh, the data pattern itself is new in the sense that it was not anticipated in the factory. So uh, then the accuracy can drop. So you know, it's it's doing the thing correctly. There's nothing wrong. So it's a different kind of error, right? Uh, the inference, if you look at the internals, every, there was, uh, I'm not talking about a case where it is doing faulty computation, computation, it's doing it correctly, it's just wrong. The end inference is wrong because the, the data pattern that it is seeing is unanticipated. Something happened in the field which was not thought of. You can, cannot possibly think of all scenarios when you construct your uh, training data set. And that is where we feel uh, one option is this swarm intent. People are proposing other mechanisms are out, out of there. There are uh, things called transfer learning and so forth, right? But this is uh, swarming is another way saying, you know, uh, a classic example is uh, say in the United States, um, or North America, a car trained with lots of data in California where it does not snow uh, moves to New York and there it starts floundering because there's a lot of snow and the terrain is difficult and different and so forth, right? So there can it, the question is, can it learn from its um, um, brother and sister cars in, in New York? Uh, so quickly teach it, teach it uh, uh, instead of sending that, that, uh, that, that car back to the factory for a month to get trained, that would be no good. So the question is, can uh, the swarm help quickly teaching somebody else uh, in, who is not up to speed. Uh, the other example is, is okay, uh, it's the same neighborhood, but uh, a less expensive car may, may have a less sophisticated engine. A more expensive car may have a much more well-trained engine, uh, or, or it could be the other way too, but I'm just saying, heterogeneous mix of cars. And so it's, a, again, in the, in, in the mentality of swarm, uh, helping each other, uh, can you quickly learn from each other and update your own machine model dynamically at the edge, and sometimes partially with the help of cloud. 
Right. As I said, the cloud has the latest information because it's talking to a whole bunch of cars. So it can occasionally push back the latest information, the latest model parameters to individual cars, uh, depending on the model type, etc. All of that can be done by the cloud also occasionally, but better still would be the cars themselves teaching each other at the edge. So um, I don't know if I answered my, your question properly. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> So, sir, in interest of there are multiple other questions, but uh, I would like limit yeah. to the last question here because we are already uh, sure. over time. So, there are a lot of students in the uh, in the session, sir, and they would like to know about how the open problem statements for the research work to take. Uh, and, and I understand that would be a one of the good question to end this session with also. So, if you could highlight some of the open problems for the researchers here in this group. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, a lot of this is open. <laughs> we are just uh, scratching the surface here. So all of us say if I take the AI part and it, we are just this is a brand new paradigm that we are thinking. There's a lot of theory needs to be built up, right? Uh, where, uh, you know, we need to understand how is there a universal way uh, of communicating knowledge, quote unquote knowledge between uh, devices, intelligent agents? Is there a universal kind of you know, language? And is there a universal way? Because otherwise, you know, it's, it's like when human beings, right? Uh, we speak different languages. Uh, we don't understand each other. That would be a problem. So it's probably early stages where we, we, it's a good time to standardize things so that you know, there's a universal format change exchanger or something where, where machines can understand a universal format so that every device on every car um, you know, converts its information that it wants to share into a universal format. Now, how is that universal format uh, going to look like? What is the best way to characterize that so that it also has to be uh, compressed, small, right? Um, and so how do you do, because it's all real time. So how do you compress this data, this fused maps? Let's say it's just maps, but even maps, you can't, you, you don't have infinite bandwidth, right? You, you have to learn how to intelligently compress and decompress all, all, all in real time, right? So if you compute the latencies today, um, it, even with 5G, we're looking at 5G now because it's, it's much improved, uh, you know, latency. Instead of the 802.11p kind of DSRC, the next thing is 5G. So, but even with that latency boost uh, or improvement, there are these fundamental architectural issues. How do I represent knowledge, which I want to share? What is the universal knowledge representation? And how do, uh, you know, how, how, how do these devices then in real time fuse knowledge together to create individual knowledge remember I have to do it in real time every every uh, every every few milliseconds or microseconds even right um, and then in the other hard problems of actual the agile part of the design process itself because we are engineers I think I, I suspect many of the uh, folks in the audience the students in the audience are electrical engineers or computer scientists computer engineers so there, I think this whole problem of uh, this thing that I was talking about, this DSOC program, how do I take uh, an application domain and in a very agile fashion, uh, construct an SOC uh, a system on a chip, but with, which is also easily programmable. So software, hardware, think of it as a software, hardware, co-designed appliance, which I want to systematically synthesize from my source workload space, my application workload, my targeted workload space. Now, we are just scratching the surface. There are two or three performers in this program who are attacking this problem in different ways, and a lot of papers are being produced and so forth, fine. But this is still a very new program and a lot of help needed. So I, I was mentioning uh, this diagram there. Uh, this is our approach, but again, this is need not be the end and description there. I didn't talk about the compiler. I didn't talk about the ontology 
problem, the, the automat automated discovery, how it is done. I just showed, showed you a slide. There are lots of results from there, but think of it, just that problem itself is very interesting. How do I, what is the right type and number of accelerators and general purpose cores that I need to support this application? Can I mathematically argue that this is the right optimal solution given a certain constraint like my chip area, uh, something which I can, and, and a power budget, right? Remember, I have real time constraints. I have to do this computation in real time. And what are the right accelerators to synthesize? Do I need an FPGA? Do I need an, a programmable diesel device on that SOC? Because things are so dynamic that. Uh, what I need as an accelerator may itself change over time. Is it is, so? A lot of open questions. Uh, how uh, and I cannot because of my opening statement. What I was mentioning, motivating. I I cannot afford to throw in 200 engineers or 300 engineers, hardware and software to design this anymore, because of this, because of this trend uh, that I was showing. We cannot afford that anymore. We need a small team, 10 to 12 engineers, in, a, in a, putting this SOC together for a given application. Uh, this is the nature of the, of the problem. So again, automation, automation, automation. How do I automatically, uh, with few people, uh, you know, construct a system such as this, a complex software hardware system, which is functional, which is verifiable, which is resilient, uh, oh my God. So this is not, I mean, this is a huge grand challenge, which is why it's a DARPA challenge program. Uh, DARPA usually works on programs which are extremely difficult and sets, sets up this challenge. So a lot of good things are coming out, but this is very much a new and open area. Uh, so architects like uh, John H uh, Hennessy and, and David Patterson, they can paint the vision, AI, a new golden age for computer architecture, but that's just a vision. <laughs> Engineers such as us, we have to make it happen. And there are lots and lots of fundamental research challenges uh, behind what I tried to paint here. It's just a very, very in initial work. <laughs> so don't worry, lots of, lots of important problems. Thank you very much, sir. I think it was uh, it was very uh, what should I say? Uh, a lot of details were there, and you, it was very interesting talk. I'm pretty sure we we learned a lot uh, through this. Uh, I I can see a lot of questions still popping up on the chat window. I'll try to summarize them and send it to you, sir. In case you get a chance, you can answer them. Sure, and and uh, I'm yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 here for another ten minutes if needed, but I, I'm I, I'm happy to do it either way. So. Thanks. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. So, um, as I said, um, so we we would like to thank you again, sir, for your uh, for accommodating this talk in your schedule. I know we had been. Um, I, I'm very glad that we first talked about it during the VLSI conference, and uh, you accepted at that moment itself. And it took a while to get all it the. Took a while uh, to get because of the, the COVID permissions. pandemic yeah. and all of that, uh, yeah. which is affecting the whole world. Yeah. I hope yeah. all of you are safe and sound and yes. remain so. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. and take all the precautions this is a very strange world really as you yeah. know <laughs> yes, so sir. yeah uh, it's a new world so very happy right. to interact with you and uh, yes sir I, I hope i was able to uh right. i don't know how, was... how many people yeah, we have roughly around 100 uh, participants who joined and which was very good. And uh, uh, it was, uh, as I said, sir, I think uh, we wanted to uh, in IEEE CAS Bangalore, we are trying to bring in a lot of different sure. topics and so that the researchers, students, as well as the professionals get uh, the futuristic uh, talks as well as the basic talks. So we have multiple sessions based on some of them are tutorials, some of them are uh, visionary talks. So we are trying to make a mix of it. And, and I am glad that you could uh, show us the vision and for sure. the next few years, what we can focus on so uh, with that, uh yeah yeah so uh, we are we are really glad to have you sir and i would like uh they wish to pitch in here uh, for the final closing comments um hey they wish would you like to uh say a few words before we close it dr devish are you there i see you on mute 
Okay. Uh, it looks like he is having some connectivity issues, sir. So uh, thank you very much, sir. I think uh, it was sure, a no very, very uh, well described session, and we would definitely be in touch with you and try yes. to chat to you next year again with some more details, if possible. Okay. Sure, definitely. And uh, do send me those questions. I am happy yes, to uh, try and answer. Sure, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. And we would send out the feedback link and the certificates tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, and have a good day, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. The bye bye. Host, hosting me. Bye bye. Take care. Sure. Thank you, sir.